this morning and inspire us to holiness, righteousness, and peace with you and our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today is the Sunday when we talk about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ. Jesus became something that wasn't natural for somebody's body to begin to glow and shine like the sun. But this was not the first time this happened. In the Old Testament reading we had, the Bible tells us that Moses went up to the mountain to behold God, to meet with God. And after spending 40 days with God, when he came down, without him knowing, his face was shining, his face was glowing. If you continue reading that passage, the Bible tells us that Moses had to cover his face because it was so radiant that people could not look at him. But in the day of Jesus, not only did his face radiate of light like the sun, his body, his clothes also shone forth. So this has happened before, but in the day of Jesus, it, it, it took a higher level. There are four points I would love to talk about today from our readings. Because these are one of the readings that when you get them in the lectionary, you begin to ask yourself, why did I choose that Sunday? Because there's so much to talk about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ and what it relates to us in our daily life. But let us look at the first thing, patience. Moses told the elders and even Joshua, wait, let me go meet God. And the same thing Jesus said to his disciples, wait here for me. As Christians, patience is really important in our life. Patience is really important in our life. The Old Testament reading we had said that when Moses and Joshua ascended to the top of the mountain, after six days, the Lord invited Moses in. It means that we must learn to be patient with ourselves, with God, with our society. The idea of patience is, a fruit, is one of the ingredients of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is quite lacking in our days, especially with the idea of you need it now, you get it now. The internet has made life very difficult. It has made it easy in some way, but difficult in terms of we have lost the idea of patience. If you ask a young person, what is that? They will just pull out their phone. They'll say Bixby or Siri or something or Google, what is that? And immediately the answer is given to them. Whether it's satisfactory or not is another question. In those days, you had to go and study endlessly in libraries, do a lot of research to find out about a topic. But now, with your phone, you can simply talk about Nigeria, even though you've never been there. There are good things about that. But when issues of life come up, people are still in that phase of, I want it now and I must get it now. People are no longer patient mm -hmm. to make money the right way. Mm -hmm. We are no longer patient to learn skill, to learn academic work in the normal way. We simply want it now and we must get it now. This is not far from Christianity. Sometimes we see powerful men and women of God preach or pray. We simply want to become like them. And we don't pay attention to the length of time these people are spent with God. We simply want to wave our hands and everybody falls to the ground. We want to lift our hands and people walk, the dead rise, without realizing that some days these are men and women who have spent time with God, being nurtured by God. I love staying around older people because I learn from their wisdom. There are things that God has provided for us in the elderly people that are around us, that he will not come to tell us directly. There are people who have lived life and they can share their experiences. These experiences were not gotten at the click of a finger. It took time and energy. Therefore, we must still be patient. If you want to cook a good meal, you must be patient. You cannot... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> the first time I moved to the UK, <laughs> I went to Tesco. 
I saw roasted chicken. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> I bought roasted chicken. Took it home, put it in the microwave. Heated it up, and I, when I put it in my mouth, I'm like, this is a mistake. <laughs> The idea of instant meal might work for certain situations, but if you want to have quality meal, like the ones we have here in Kirk Hallam, you must be patient with yourself and with your food and the oven. So that is really important. Another thing we ought to learn from all these our readings today is the idea of faithful followership. Faithful followership. We must learn to put ourselves under the grace of God, pay attention and be humble and follow Christ. Joshua followed Moses faithfully. The disciples of Jesus, Peter, James, and John, followed Jesus patiently, faithfully, listening to their master. The idea of faithfulness is beginning to drop in our society, especially when we look at our politicians, of how much they lie, and how much they tell us that it's going to be fine. And after a couple of days, they come out and tell us, oh, it is no longer be fine. And when we remind them of what they said before, that it was going to be fine, they tell us that we are the problem. Therefore, faithfulness is lacking. Faithfulness in the ministers of God, <laughs> that people like myself trivialize the grace of God. We take advantage of people, not realizing that we are still followers of Jesus Christ. I often say to a lot of people, first, we are followers of Christ. We are all disciples of Jesus Christ. Whether you are termed the man of God, woman of God, people of God, lay person of God, does not matter. Your, your, the name given to you does not matter. First of all, we are all called to be children of God. And that is the most important thing. Therefore, we must do this faithfully. And how can we do this faithfully? By loving our neighbor, by loving God and helping one another. What does it mean to love neighbor? Loving neighbor does not simply mean, oh, you want to jump into the Red Sea. Bye, it's your choice. <laughs> that is not the idea of Christian love. The Christian love calls us to be sacrificial with ourselves, to spend time with people that matter, <laughs> to spend our energy, to spend our resources, to give, not because we have too much, but because we have that to share, because we have something to share. There was something that was uh, a story that was told of um, Mother Teresa uh, that she gave a poor woman food to go eat. The woman went back and shared with her Muslim neighbors. She said that in as much as she didn't have, she also knew people who didn't have. That is Christian love. Christian love does not wait for abundance. Christian love waits for a need that needs to be solved. And also loving God. What does it mean to love God? To sound theological and to look like I have a degree in theology, <laughs> the Christian love talks about loving God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Everything about you. Everything about you. Following the teachings of Christ. Humbling yourself under the, under the grace of God. Realizing that we cannot do it on our own. Realizing that we cannot do it on our own. No matter the power and the level we find ourselves in life, we cannot do it on our own. A couple of years ago, COVID taught us that we cannot do it on our own. We can't. People who had money, their money became irrelevant. People who had power, their power became irrelevant. People who had private jets could not even fly because there was nowhere to go. People who had money. There was nothing. I had to drive around three towns to buy rice while we were in Durham. Because some people went in and took all the rice, the flour, and the toilet rolls that were in Tesco, Aldi, and all the shops. So we had to drive around looking for food. So God is calling us to love Him, to place Him first in our life. To place Him first in our life. This is faithful followership. Knowing that God calls us first to be his children and nothing more. There's another important thing. The theology of place. There are places that are sacred to us. Like this church. During COVID, when the second lockdown happened, and we were told in college then that we could no longer go into chapel. Ooh, 
I could have been like, I was among those who protested. I'm like, I need to go into church. Before, it wasn't really important. But when we have things, we don't realize how important it is. Imagine tomorrow you get an email that all sense Kirk Hallam has been closed and we shall not be worshipping here anymore. How would you feel? <laughs> yes. It will be that difficult. It will be that difficult. Not just because this is a nice place, but there has been a lot of prayer said here. There has been a lot of encounter with God. People have had their testimonies here in this church. People feel life in this church. Therefore, we cannot simply throw it away. There was a reason why Jesus took his disciples to the mountain top. First, to separate them from the world, to cause them to focus on God. Therefore, make use of this space. Make use of this church. Find a place where you can pray, where you can think about God and encounter God in a different way. Not just in your heart, but there are locations where we can be, just like this sacred place today, where we have come together to study, to look at one another, to smile, to drink tea and coffee and biscuits, and to be happy with one another. This place is set apart by God for children of God to meet. And that is important. <clears throat> and finally, the Bible tells us that Jesus was transfigured. Jesus was transfigured. The light came out of Jesus. It wasn't a light shining on him. That is important to know about the transfiguration. It wasn't that somebody was somewhere pointing a light at Jesus. Or, some, or maybe he was reflecting the moon. The idea of the transfiguration was that the light came from inside out. His face shone. It wasn't light coming on him. And this is what happens to a Christian. When, when our lives have been transfigured, when our lives have been transformed, when we have come in contact with God, things change. People see the goodness of God flowing out of us. The Bible said, out of you shall flow rivers of living water. People see kindness flowing. People see wonderful smile flowing. People see happiness and joy flowing. That is the transfiguration. You and I, our faces may not shine like the sun, but people look at us and they are like, why is this woman always happy? It is not because things terrible don't happen around you. It's because there is a grace in you that your body can no longer control it. That the Spirit of God is shining out through you. When there are challenges, you are the one to speak out. Speak against injustice. Speak against evil in our society, our world, our communities. Because there is a grace in you that is pushing you to shine for God. There's a little song we used to sing those days. This little light of mine. I will let it shine. Ooh. This little light of mine. This little light of yours, you will, you will let it shine. And that's the transfiguration. Lent is starting this Wednesday. A time when we begin to pray, to repent, to turn around from evil to good. Will your life be transfigured? Will your life be transformed? Last Christmas, I told us that perhaps we need to take a task for this Lent that is coming. Have you ever been to the Bible study group on Tuesday? Maybe consider going to that Bible study group. Have you ever been to the Mother's Union? Why don't try come? We are not saying become a member. Just try and come. Have you been to the Saturday prayer meeting? Why don't you try it for one or two weeks? Or join the gardening gang? Or join the church uh, cleaners to clean? Do something different this Lenten season. Not just in giving up food or chocolates or TV <coughs> or social media or something. Do something you've not done before. Take out time. Perhaps join the choir for two weeks or one week. See how they sing. Join them. Enjoy the music even if you don't know how to sing. Keep looking at them. They will not kick you out. I, I bet you. <laughs> you may enjoy it much more. But do something in this church that you've never done before. Oh. Even if it's once in this Lenten season. To challenge yourself. To check up your life. To shake up yourself. And ask God, what am I going to do in these six weeks that is coming up? Lent is for six weeks. It's offering us an opportunity to do different, to think differently. And I pray that in this season that you'll be patient with God and with yourself. And that you'll be a faithful follower. And that your life will be transfigured as you meet God in sacred places and in the ordinary places of the world. 
May the Lord's light shine upon you, that every darkness of pain, of grief, of gloom will be dispersed in your life, that joy that only God can give will descend upon you. Amen. Amen. Amen.